If you are thinking about making a DIY lithium battery and you want it to be better and safer than anything you can buy, then you definitely should see this. Recently, the first battery I have ever made has gone bad and it's not worth repairing anymore. I have used that battery on my e-bike almost every day for five years. That is not a bad life cycle from something made out of recycled lithium-ion cells. So now I decided to build a completely new battery so I could share my knowledge with you on how to build a great lithium-ion battery. Let's get to it. There is a table of content in the description if you want to skip to a certain part. So first, you need some cells. Here I have some very good recycled lithium ion cells. Every one of those have the capacity of almost 3 amps per hour. Now you could use cells of any capacity. It really comes down to acceptable weight and available space in your application. Next you need to start compiling balanced series. I will build a battery of 13 series. That's a 48 volt battery. Now to do this you need to know the exact capacity of every single cell even if they are new. If you don't know how to measure capacity, check the link in the description. Start compiling first row with cells that are of the biggest capacity and gradually continue towards smaller capacity cells. On the second row, move in the opposite direction. This way, preliminary balancing between capacities of series will happen automatically. Calculate the exact capacity of a series after you compile a row and write it down. Now after the third row, the difference between the biggest and the smallest series got to 40 milliamps. And after the fifth row, I got all series to exactly the same capacity by hand-picking cells of just the right capacity. Then I repeated the process and ended compiling after the seventh row. So the capacity of this battery will be around 20 amps per hour. 20 amps at 48 volts equals to 0.96 kilowatts per hour. That's going to be a nice battery pack for my old e-bike. Next, you need to make sure that all of those cells are okay. A recently tested cell should give a minimum reading of 3.2 volts. If it shows less, I advise you to replace that cell. So now we need to assemble our pack. Take the first series and arrange all the cells facing in the same direction. Take something heavy to press them together. I think the best way to assemble cells into a pack is hot glue. If you want, you can use some casings or some other mechanical way of keeping cells together. I will show you how to assemble a great pack using just hot glue. Apply hot glue between cells. Carefully flip the series around and do the other side. When all is done, you will have a pile of series. Now you can make one big battery pack like this, but I will divide this in two battery packs. Next, start gluing series together. Be fast here since hot glue cools down very fast when applied on a cell. Now you can make a pack of any shape and form. I always use the simple brick configuration. And there are reasons for that. Please keep watching. So in brick configuration, you need to arrange series facing opposite ways. Positive, negative, positive, and so on. So I will have two packs, one of 6S and another one of 7S. I will attach them on both sides of the rear wheel on my e-bike. Next, we need to glue the ends, since cells in those areas are not glued as well as the ones on the sides. Also, at this point, I like to put some tape for additional protection. And here they are, assembly is complete. Arranged like this, the pack is very compact, durable, and the distance between poles is minimum. Also, if service is needed in the future, hot glue comes off pretty easily. So now we are going to connect cells together. I use soldering for that. It's affordable and gives the possibility to attach any type of wire to a cell. To do this, we need a very powerful soldering iron. We need a fast way of generating enough heat on the surface of the cell so that we don't overheat the cell. That sounds funny, but that's how it works. So we need a lot of power. If you use a small iron, the cell will just suck all the heat out of it. Solder won't flow and the result will be an overheated cell and a poor connection to the wire. We need to pre-solder both sides on every cell. Try to do this quickly and apply just enough solder to prepare the connection. Now we're ready for attaching bus leads. For this, I use just some regular household wire that is rated at around 15 amps. In my experience, 
this will be sufficient since these wires are short and this battery will output just a maximum of 40 amps. The main thing here is that it has to be copper. This multi-threaded wire is the best choice. It is easy to solder and that connection will be physically very strong. I used to use a single threaded copper wire like this before, but I found out that it made a poor physical connection when soldered and also it requires more heat when soldering. So strip some wire, twist it and you should get some bus leads like this. If you have a battery of 13S, you need 14 leads. One of those will be the last bus lead to connect wire fuses to. Yes, I always use fuses on every cell. More on that later. I made two different types of bus leads. Lighter ones and heavier ones, which are just two lighter ones twisted together. Now the heavier ones will be the positive and the negative output of this battery pack and lighter ones will be in the middle of the battery pack since those ones won't actually ever experience full power. So start with soldering a heavier bus lead to the negative side at the end of the pack. That's going to be the negative output of this whole pack. Next solder lighter leads to all the rest of the negative sides of series in this pack. And at the end you should have one, or in my situation, two heavier bus leads left. This last heavy lead will be the positive output of the whole battery pack. Now it's time to make all the rest of the connections. For this I will be using a separate thin steel wire on every cell. This wire will also act as an individual fuse on every single cell in the pack. A wire will be connected between the positive pole on a cell and the bus lead. I use individual fuses on my cells because of safety. If one of the cells goes bad and creates a shirt circuit, that will put the whole Siri in a shirt circuit. And that will be super bad. Also, there are other reasons for using individual fuses. Ask me in the comments if you want to know more about that and please subscribe to my channel right now. First, we need to prepare our pack for soldering fuses. We need to add some material underneath those fuses to protect the corners of cells from melting and shirt circuiting. Now we need some material that won't melt. I found out that the cover material of a double-sided tape is the best for that. It's basically baking paper. So cut it in strips and apply. Keep track of where it needs to go. Start from the negative bus lead and move forward in a zigzag motion. So now we are ready to solder fuses. To determine a suitable thickness of a wire fuse, you need to know two things. What is the amp rating on the main fuse on that system you're going to be using this battery on? And the second thing is the amount of cells in a series. I have a 40 amp main fuse on my e-bike and 7 cells in a series on this battery. Divide 40 by 7 and you will get 5.7 amps. This means that any one cell in a pack won't ever output more than 5.7 amps. Because after that the main fuse will pop. So for me the individual fuse rating has to be more than 5.7. Now I tested some steel wires. This was very fun to do. Finally I found out a configuration that handled a peak of around 20 amps. 20 amp fuse will be just right for this battery pack for me. Ask me in the comments if you want to know how to do a test like that. So let's solder these fuses. I twisted three steel wires into one to have that 20 amp rating. Now the length has to be about 50% more than this V shape I am showing here. Start by soldering one end to the positive pole. Pull it out a little bit so there won't be any tension. Then solder the next positive pole. Make sure that you have a good connection and add more solder if you need it. Then solder the bus lead side and cut the excessive wire off. Now when you move to the second row, you need to use some masking tape to protect other cells from an accidental shirt that happens. When you're ready to do the other side, be sure that there is no metal on your table. And now all is done. You need to be careful when handling a battery at this point since voltages are now combined and basically this battery is ready. Except those last positive bus leads, 
we will deal with that later. Now it's time to connect the main power leads. I always use XT60 connectors on my batteries because they are super durable and affordable. And for this battery, I chose to use copper wires from a long power extension cord designed for outdoor use. This is just perfect for this battery. It has a rubber coating. Now you need to decide the length of the main power wires. This length will be good for my battery. The best place to position those is next to the main positive output. And to make this job a little easier, glue them in place with some hot glue. Next, travel the negative wire to the negative bus lead and cut the unnecessary wire off. I always try to position the connection in the middle of the bus lead. More on that later. Next step requires some explaining. I don't use battery management systems on my batteries. They are unreliable and I don't like the way they balance charge a battery. But I do use a battery monitoring system like this. You attach this small device to the balance leads and it individually monitors voltages of every series. If a voltage of a series goes below acceptable, you will hear a very loud sound. And for charging, I use my own DIY balance charger. Check the link in the description if you want to know how to make one. It's super easy and very cheap. Or you can use a balance charger like this. To connect those systems, you need balance leads like this. Now you can use any type of connector, but this type is a standard and it's designed to fit chargers and monitoring systems. I will be connecting two of those on my divided pack. One has eight wires and another one has seven wires. So let's continue. There has to be a black wire on one end of the balance connector. So decide the length and travel that black wire alongside the main negative power wire. Connect them together and solder the negative bus lead on the battery. Next, tape the balance connector in place uh, to make this job a little bit easier. Take the next balance wire that comes after that black negative one and travel that to the next bus lead on the battery. That will be on the other side. Then take the next balance wire and travel that to the next bus lead, which will again be on the opposite side from the last one. Repeat these steps until you have only the positive main wire and the last balance wire left. Next, let's finish up our connections. Apply a big strip of that double-sided tape we used before to protect the corners of these cells. Here I actually decided now to use the last bus lead since I had a lot of that fat main wire to spare. You can also do that on the negative side. So strip it and solder the last balance lead to it. Next we are going to solder our last fuses. First solder the positive pole. Then loop that wire around the bus lead and solder it to the next positive pole. This first one is a little tricky, but it will get easier. Reposition your pack and solder the wire to the bus lead. Put some tape on that end to make this job easier. Then solder the rest of the fuses. Now if you have double-sided tape with some padding like this, this, this thick stuff, put that under the last bus lead. But if you don't have that tape, just make sure there are no sharp edges on that bus lead. Next, secure this bus lead with some tape. Also, I like to protect wires with tape. Just make sure that you will be able to tell where the negative balance wire is on that connector. So now we have a fully functional battery, but there are still some steps to go before we can use this. Also here I decided to double the negative bus lead with that wire I had left over. This is actually not necessary, but I did it anyway. Now, don't worry about those bus leads in the middle being so thin. Because of this fuse configuration, power spreads evenly to this whole area. So there are no hot spots. But you should think about the main power connections. When connected like this in the middle, there will be hot spots here and here, but that resistance will be two times smaller than if connected at the ends of this bus lead. So now we have a fully functional battery, but before we start using it, let's protect those fragile fuses. For the first layer of protection, I use this laminate floor underlay material. It's perfect for this. It will protect the fuses and the corners and smooth out all of the wires on the surface. This stuff doesn't burn, but it does melt. And actually, this is a good thing, since we won't be soldering anymore, 
And if you service this battery later, it will be very easy to see if there were any heat problems because that material will be a little bit melted. I wrapped two layers of this material. That will protect fuses and corners very well. Now if you are wondering about how this will affect the heat generated from this battery, I will get to that at the end of this video. Please keep watching. Additionally, I will use another type of laminate floor underlay. This material is a little bit more stiff. That will additionally protect our fuses from outside contact. I only put this material on the two biggest sides. At this point, you can start using your battery. But I will go ahead and make it more durable and waterproof. I started waterproofing my batteries after a heavy rain had destroyed one of my biggest best batteries and I was very sad. For this job I use food grade plastic wrap and it has been working very well. Now you have to protect this layer with something more durable. For that I use duct tape and because duct tape has a tendency to release itself I add a layer of basic packing tape since this stuff does not ever come off. And here they are. Powerful, super safe, durable and waterproof. Next I will charge them and go for a test drive. Now about the heat issue. Yes, all of this wrapping will make this battery work less efficient when used at full power. But I have to make that compromise. This battery will experience a lot of movement and vibration. That means rubbing against zip ties and parts on my e-bike. And also occasionally I will get into a heavy rain. If for example you want to build a power wall battery, which you can do, uh, you don't need all of this wrapping. And another way of addressing the heat issue is making a bigger battery. The more capacity you have, the less heat it will generate. Ask me in the comments if you have any questions, I will be glad to help you. Please like and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.